Cameras, every smartphone has one. Actually, most of them have about three, even the cheapy crappy ones. But we're not looking at the cheapy crappy ones because this isn't the cheapest crappiest camera phones roundup. No, by golly, it's the best camera phones roundup featuring only the most grown thrust and the powerful smartphone snappers from Samsung, Google, Xiaomi, Huawei, loads of the buggers. But enough blather, here's the video. And for more videos like this video, please do poke subscribe and ding that notifications bell. Cheers. So one of the most obvious choices for proper good smartphone optics is Google's Pixel 7 or the more expensive but even more impressive Pixel 7 Pro. These flagship phones are less expensive than some rivals but they serve up some seriously slick hardware and a shag load of excellent Pixel exclusive features that make life just that little bit easier. That Tensor chipset isn't as beefy as Qualcomm's latest Snapdragon but the Pixel 7 phones can still blaze through a bit of Genshin impact on demand while battery life is pretty bloody good too. When it comes to the cameras, that primary sensor hasn't changed up at all from last year's 50 megapixel Octopd quad beer effort. And I would say it's a mite disappointing that there's no hardware upgrade here, but as that old saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't f about with it. And things most certainly ain't broke because the Pixel 7 pair boasts the best point and shoot camera performance of any smartphone in 2022. When you're shooting people or animals, you can swap to the excellent portrait mode and get gorgeous results with bokeh that you can mess about with in post-processing if you wanna. And the Pixels boast a swift shutter speed too, so you can capture loads of photos in quick succession and make sure you nail those blink and you'll miss some moments. Complicated shots tainted with strong contrast aren't a problem either, especially using Google's handy on-screen brightness sliders. And even if the lighting is full on, you won't see much saturation and colors will appear natural. Google's night vision mode can be automatically activated by the phone whenever the lighting is cack and I would recommend not fiddling with that particular setting as it makes a real difference, essentially allowing you to see in the dark. Absolutely stellar stuff. And both Pixel 7 smartphones also offer up a alternative 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter. And while colours aren't quite as realistic with this option, it is there if you want to fit more into frame. Now when it comes to that camera tech, the major advantage that the Pixel 7 Pro has over its regular sibling is the fact that it's got a 48 megapixel telephoto lens on there with five times optical zoom. And that's bolstered by a bit of optical image stabilization just like the primary shooter and it's an option that's just straight up cut out of the regular Pixel 7. When you're capturing a photo between 2.5 times and 5 times zoom levels, you'll end up with a hybrid photo stitched together from images taken with the primary and the telephoto sensors, meaning pleasingly crisp detail and no compromises. And when you push in over the 5 times zoom level, it's telephoto all the way. And I've got to say, even most of the way up to the 30 times zoom cap, I got some bloody good results. This is easily one of the best telephoto shooters that I've ever tested, perfect for snapping kids, pets, anything that you don't want to disturb for natural looking images. Even in very low light, it doesn't fall apart, producing quite crisp results with help from that stabilization. And I gotta admit, I really missed that telephoto option whenever I was just snapping away with the regular Pixel 7. Yeah, it's, it's just like, oh, why? Arr. Switch things up with a bit of video, and again, these Pixels do a great job with minimal effort. You don't have an AK option, but my 4K test clips were crisp and detailed enough to enjoy on a telly screen, with detail levels only really dropping when the lighting became more problematic. Vibrant colours are again ably captured, and you can swap between all of the lenses as you record. And this isn't too jarring, although colour accuracy does take a hit when you're away from that primary sensor. The telephoto lens on the Pixel 7 Pro is particularly impressive in low light, while the optical image stabilisation once again counters any vicious hand sway, caused by a few too many surprisingly strong lagers. And as for audio, well, I'd have preferred some better wind cancellation, but otherwise it's top stuff. The Pixel 7s come with a cinematic mode, which, like Samsung's portrait video mode, adds a bokeh style effect behind your subject, although a month on this hasn't improved at all. If your subject moves at all, the Pixel easily loses track and goes a bit berserk, so for now, just avoid. And likewise, all the motion stuff which can add fake motion blur or mimic a long exposure shot is okay, but it can be quite shonky and frankly feels a bit gimmicky and I imagine most people wouldn't even bother touching it. And if you get yourself the Pixel 7 Pro, where well, you'll also find you've got a macro mode on board. And this can automatically activate whenever you get really, really close up to something. We're talking like a couple of centimeters away. What it does is it automatically switches to the ultra wide angle shooter, which on the Pro has an auto focus, unlike the regular Pixel 7, hence you don't get that macro mode here. 
And the results aren't bad at all, although I still prefer to just take high-res images on phones with massive camera sensors and then simply crop in as you don't have any stress from shadows or other issues. And one of the other new highlights of taking photos on these Pixel phones is the Photo De-Blur feature as well, which to be honest, I really didn't have to use very often at all because it's very rare to get a blurry shot on these two. And I gotta admit, I'm still not convinced. It can help a little bit with blur, but it's not quite the miracle tool that some are making it out to be. It's certainly not as immediately valuable and impressive as Google's tool, which wipes out any background stragglers, effectively eliminating them from existence. But hopefully over time, with a good bit of machine learning or whatever, that de-blur tool will really be worth its weight in gold. And last up for the optics, both Pixel 7 phones pack a simple 10.8 meg fixed focus selfie shooter, which has been okay for those social media snaps. In low light, it's once again sometimes a bit crap, vomiting out blurry, unsavoury pics, especially if you're not entirely still. Definitely best used when conditions are favourable. If you can't quite afford these shiny wee blighters, well, you don't have to resort to pulling out Grand's gold teeth. The Pixel 7 Air is almost as good as those Pixel 7 flagship phones and yet considerably cheaper. And yes, you once again get a very capable, very dependable camera. The Pixel 7 Air rocks a 64 meg Sony IMX787 sensor set alongside your typical ultra-wide angle shooter. This new hardware combined with Google's image processing chops is a solid combo in most circumstances, so I was happy enough with the majority of my test photos. The lens does a dependable job of locking onto your subject following an update, even if the scene is rather messy, while images are impressively lifelike rather than manipulated to look more pleasing to the eye. If it's a sunny day, you'll have to be a little bit careful to avoid any lens flare, but otherwise the Pixel 7a can cope well with harsh backlighting. HDR ain't a problem with blue skies capably captured. Those portrait chops are pretty decent too. This phone can even deal with crazy windswept hair and furry subjects like this wee chap. Ambient snaps can look a little bit soft at times, those textures and facial features can be just a wee bit too smooth, but colours are usually on point and as long as there's no rapid movement then you'll get sharp enough results. My indoor pics had plenty of finer details packed in there. Your manual controls are limited to EV and contrast basically. If you want anything more complex than that, then you're going to have to look at an alternative blower. But those on-screen sliders work really, really well and they can rescue an otherwise murky looking shot. And this comes in handy at times in the evenings, although this blower does a solid job there too. Strong lighting can pose a problem in a night scenario, but otherwise it's all good. We're talking not much noise and a reasonable amount of detail. Now that 13 meg ultra wide angle shooter is another Sony IMX special and photos shot with this are rather consistent. Once again producing natural tones just like the primary shooter if not quite as much detail. Although unfortunately the distortion is rather bad which heavily distracts. And there's no telephoto shooter here just like the regular Pixel 7 and pretty much every other mid-ranger you'll find at this sort of price point. So the Pixel 7 here is limited to a mere 8x digital zoom. The Pixel 7 Air can also record up to 4K resolution video and it's certainly fine if not remarkable in this department. Visuals are sharp and well defined as long as you're not shooting in the dark and even in the evenings you'll usually get something that works. That focus still occasionally pops especially if the lighting sucks but the stabilisation is good enough for moving about and recording even at that Ultra HD level. Audio capture is also good as long as the environment isn't too noisy and there's not much wind. And last up, that 13 meg selfie snapper is okay-ish. It's not the worst, but it's pretty bog standard stuff, pumping out soft, bland snaps if the lighting ain't great. If you're obsessed with posting pics of your gun and mug online, you may be swayed by another handset like the Galaxy A54. Now, a hot rival for the Pixel 7 phones comes courtesy of Apple with its latest iPhone 14 series of smartphones and their just as flamboyant camera design. If you want the beefiest hardware, you will need to spunk out a grand for the Pro or Pro Max models, which sport a fresh new 48 megapixel sensor with upgraded optical image stabilization. Indeed, the iPhone 14 Pro Max generally copes just as well with outdoor HDR situations as the very best Android smartphones. Lighter areas aren't whitewashed, while darker regions are brightened up for clear visibility. And yeah, this kills some of the atmosphere, but it does mean you get plenty of detail packed into your pics although the balancing act doesn't always work as intended. I have seen quite a lot of flaring in bright light, annoyingly, which didn't seem quite so obvious in my first couple of months with this phone, mostly because it's released in f***ing winter. 
As for the colour reproduction, well, Apple seems to be drinking from the same watering hole as Samsung, boost and tone so they really pop rather than spaffing out more natural looking pics. It's certainly a crowd pleasing effect and I did enjoy the vivid hues on some of my test photos. When it comes to glorious landscapes and also attractive portraits, that is where the iPhone truly shines. More ambient photos sadly aren't too hot. Colours suddenly aren't as bright and bold and some of my indoor snaps suffer from severe noise and artefacting which is a big and rather nasty surprise from a premium price device like this. In low light you will get reasonably bright results if you employ the dedicated night mode, although any actual light sources get blown out as usual. It's a shame that these situations of tricky contrast aren't as well handled as the reverse numbers. The Pro Max also packs a simple 12 meg ultra wide angle lens which comes in handy when you're dealing with those sweeping vistas as well as a 12 meg telephoto lens which takes over when you zoom in beyond the three times level. Good news is tones are consistent across all three of Apple's sensors so you don't get photos that look like they were taken with a completely different device. Unfortunately though the 15 times zoom is inferior to many flagships out there including the Galaxy S23 Ultra, the Xiaomi 13 Pro etc etc and even at the 15 times level here your pics will look blocky but it is certainly good enough for sneaking closer to your subject without getting all up in their face. However the iPhone 14 Pro Max does excel when it comes to video even if there is no 8K option. My Ultra HD footage looks marvellous as long as lighting isn't too ropey with a 60fps cap. You can happily cycle between all three lenses as you shoot and Apple's image stabilisation is fantastic so no worries whatsoever if you want to move around as you're recording. Audio capture is crystal clear even in quite challenging conditions, unperturbed by strong winds and other potential hurdles. So if you want something to shoot a load of video, the iPhone 14 Pro Max is right up there with Samsung's Galaxy S23 blowers. And just like the Pixel 7 series of smartphones, you don't get an awful lot of bonus camera modes chucked on here. It's pretty bare bones, but it's got all the essential stuff. You do not get a dedicated Pro mode of any description though. If you want something like that, you will have to look at an alternative Android effort. And meanwhile, that selfie cam is a 12 meg shooter that does a good job most times of day, capturing all of those lovely sags and wrinkles and blotchy bits with slightly boosted tones. This front facer once again struggles a bit in low light but can handle strong backlighting without absolutely wrecking its Y fronts. Now one of the biggest smartphones to launch thus far in 2023 in both a metaphorical and a literal sense is Samsung's Galaxy S23 Ultra. This 6.8 inch Titan serves up all of the usual features including a lush AMOLED screen and of course that nifty S Pen stylus. Plus you've got plenty of power thanks to Qualcomm's Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 replacing the usual disappointing Exynos effort. But while the regular S23 and the S23 Plus rather boringly stuck with very familiar camera hardware, Sammy at least slapped a fresh new 200 megapixel sensor on the S23 Ultra for improved low light photography. Now this is actually Samsung's Isocell HP2 sensor which is the same size as last year's 108 meg sensor found in the S22 Ultra. This isn't as big as sensors found in rivals like the Xiaomi 13 Pro but hands down this is one of the best smartphones for capturing memories and making them look really bloody good. Whether you're buggering about down the DIY shop or taking in breathtaking vistas on the other side of the world. And this is all just in full auto mode too. Just point and shoot like those pixel phones, no brain power required. By default the S23 Ultra uses 16 in 1 pixel binning versus 9 in 1 on the old S22 Ultra while also benefiting from Samsung's enhanced super quad pixel autofocus. This uses that 200 meg sensor to accurately determine distances and keep your subject perfectly crisp. And let me tell you this phone almost never pumps out a fuzzy or blurry shot even in the most tricky lighting conditions. You can boost colours and enhance textures with Samsung's scene optimizer mode or go for a more natural vibe by shutting it off. That's completely up to you. The S23 Ultra is fantastic for capturing accurate tones with the portrait mode impressing even in proper low light. And as for HDR situations, well the Ultra is again better than most of its peers including the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. Only the Huawei P60 Pro has a slight edge in these high contrast circumstances. Speaking of the P60 Pro, that also has the Galaxy slightly beat when it comes to night snaps. But the S23 Ultra is a very close second. Low light picks still pack in a serious amount of fine detail and this phone keeps noise at bay with a cocky swagger. Just make sure your subject is still otherwise they might be a little bit blurred. And while colours might be a little bit boosted at night time compared with other flagships, this does allow for a more attractive final result. 
As for the other lenses slapped on the RSM there, well, there's no real changes versus the old S22 Ultra. The 12 meg ultra wide angle shooter is fine, though not as capable in darker conditions, especially again if there's any kind of motion. And you also have dual 10 meg telephoto shooters, one working at 3 times optical zoom, the other offering 10 times zoom. So you can pinch all the way in up to 100 times if you like. And that zoom lens is still among the greatest on par with the Huawei P60 Pro in everything but more ambient lighting, where things certainly get a little softer and murkier here on the S23 Ultra. No real surprises when it comes to the bonus camera modes here on the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra. It's absolutely stuffed with extra bits like the obligatory food mode, expert role, which has now been integrated in there. You've got the pro mode as well if you actually want to fiddle around with the individual camera settings. And if you want to tweak your photo after you've taken it, well, you've got more options now in the gallery app. And I also recommend downloading Samsung's Enhance X app from its very own app store. This can be helpful if you want to remove shadows or nasty reflections when shooting through glass. Definitely check out my shorts on the app for a closer look. Now in video mode, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra is once again an absolute belter. You can shoot up to 8K resolution video, now with a wider than ever viewing angle and at 30 frames per second. Or choose from 30 or 60 FPS in 4K mode. Either way, the visuals are crispy, the colours are true to life, and that stabilisation is tastily smooth, even when you're wandering about the place and panning the camera. And the only time I saw the focus struggle even a teeny bit was when shooting a flamboyant metal band with lasers and flailing limbs and all kinds of shenanigans going off. And even then, the S23 Ultra mostly kept up with it all. And last up, Samsung's Galaxy S23 Ultra sports a 12 meg selfie cam. That's fewer MPs than before, but it's still pretty good, as long as you've got a decent bit of lighting. Otherwise, your snaps can get a bit grainy and dark with flaccid tones. And if you can't quite stretch to the slightly scary asking price of the S23 Ultra, you might find a good deal on last year's S22 Ultra. The Exynos chipset in half as impressive as the Snapdragon, but there's no denying those optics are still mightily impressive, if not quite as outstanding in low light. The S22 Ultra churns out good looking photos 9 times out of 10 with very little effort. I did see a little saturation in some of my test photos when the sun was being a proper knob and shining in a really awkward place, but in most circumstances the S22 Ultra can happily deal with strong lighting and deep contrast. That focus is fast acting as is the image processing so you'll rarely miss a shot because the camera can't keep up. Indoor shots can certainly still look a little soft and warm unless the lighting is particularly good, but the S22 Ultra can still make the most of the situation more often than not, as long as your subject isn't doing anything annoying like moving about the place. Any flapping can really flummox this phone. And at night, the Ultra really excels compared with many rivals. Only the very best phones like the Oppo Find X5 Pro and the Pixel 6 can replicate a scene so vividly with so little light to work with. The dedicated night mode can also help brighten up things a bit when needed. Meanwhile, the ultra-wide angle shooter serves up an eye-catch and pulled back view when you're snapping some scenery and without too much distortion or other issues. Colours are a bit off at night and in low light, but overall it's still one of the better efforts out there. However, the real reason to get the ultra over other Samsung smartphones is the ridiculous space zoom. Up to around the 30x zoom mark, you'll still get sharp detailed shots, which is an absolute godsend when you're trying to snap wildlife or kids without intruding on the action. It even works pretty well at night, although whatever the conditions, once you pass that 30x times zoom level, you will notice that the detail in your pics drops quite dramatically, and by 50 times and above, things are looking decidedly dire. As ever, Samsung has piled a ton of bonus camera modes into the Ultra, including a food mode which does actually make your grub look more appetising. The portrait mode usually works pretty well, adding a convincing bokeh style effect to your photos, although if you are unhappy you can always reverse the effect afterwards. And then there's my personal favourite, the single take mode, which spats out a whole bunch of quirky photos and video clips captured over a short time frame, definitely perfect for shooting your kids random antics. I also highly rate the Samsung S22 Ultra when it comes to the home movies. That stabilisation is fantastic, even at 4K resolution. You can actually shoot smooth looking footage when you're dangling from a jeep and even when you're aiming at a moving subject while using the telephoto lens. Although don't zoom in too far or yes, this will likely happen. Swapping between the different lenses is a relatively smooth experience, giving you the flexibility to zoom in and out with just a quick tap while recording. 
Moving subjects look smooth on playback and, as with snap and photos, as long as the lighting conditions are decent, you will get plenty of detail packed into every frame. Shooting video at night isn't much of a problem either, if not quite as impressive as the Find X5 phones. Things can get a bit grainy, but no worse than with many other handsets. An audio pickup is just as good. My test videos boast rich stereo sound with clear recording from all directions, but favouring whatever is directly in front of the lens. The selfie shooter does a decent job too. Like the rear cam, this can handle strong lighting without having a breakdown, while the view can be expanded if you want to fit in more mates or more background action. Again, in low light, the results can be a bit soft and grainy, and you will want to keep your hands super steady to avoid any blur. Not an easy task when clutching a massive beer, having already drunk two massive beers. Now, Oppo sadly doesn't really seem to be releasing many of its new smartphones here in Blighty anymore, and yes, that does include the beefy new Fine X6 Pro flagship phone, which once again boasts some typically capable camera tech. But thankfully, you can at least still get your hands on last year's Fine X5 Pro, which is still a bit of a cracker. This is a gold star smartphone in pretty much every area, from the excellent battery life to the tip top performance and that satisfying user experience. But the real highlight here is that versatile camera setup, even if the telephoto lens isn't quite as impressive as some rivals. The primary sensor is Sony's IMX766, which has been used by quite a lot of smartphones recently, but Oppo has added extra smarts in there to ensure top quality results. So for one, you've got some next level five axis image stabilization built into this thing, supposed to help you out with your low light photography. You've also got a lens which is constructed from glass and that'll help prevent any, you know, halo and effects or the light based shenanigans that might bugger up your shot. And most importantly, photos are processed by Oppo's own Marisilicon Imogen NPU rather than the Snapdragon chipset that runs the show. But does this actually make for more realistic, good looking pics? Well, the Oppo Find X5 Pro is a very dependable snapper at least 9 times out of 10. The majority of my test shots taken in auto mode came out remarkably true to life, with similar results to Google's excellent Pixel 6 smartphones. HDR situations are generally well handled, with plenty of details still popping up in those darker areas, and not much flaring in the lighter bits, although I definitely did see some saturation in some of my test photos. Those colours occasionally come out a little bit bleached, nothing extreme, but it definitely does make your pick look less pretty. Good news if you're a night owl, because I got next to no blur in my evening shots thanks to the excellent stabilisation, even after I'd quaffed quite a few shandies. Although if your subject is moving as you take the shot, this will result in some blurry shenanigans. But colour reproduction is again close to natural, even when the light is rather sparse, and you still get a good amount of detail crammed into every frame. The camera software has actually been updated a couple of times since I started testing out the Oppo Find X5 Pro, although I haven't noticed any real change in the performance to be perfectly honest. I'm kind of hoping that they do manage to deal retroactively with some of the saturation issues though. Now one of the snazzy exclusive new features here are the three new Hasselblad Master style filters as designed by a trio of pro photographer dudes. And they are Radiance, Serenity and Emerald. My favourite is definitely Radiance because this turns the sky a crazy cartoonish colour that makes every outdoor photo really stand out. You've also now got the lovably bonkers Hasselblad X-Pan mode, which replicates a vintage shooting experience with a panorama style 65 by 24 aspect ratio. I'm not sure when this would ever really come in useful to be honest, but whatever, it is fun to bugger about with occasionally. And the Oppo Find X5 Pro also serves up a 50 megapixel ultra wide angle lens with a 110 degree view and the image processing is once again powered by Marisilicon like all the other cameras here. If the lighting is strong you'll generally capture natural tones again although you do often end up with colder photos in sort of lower light but even then you'll generally still get crisp photos stuffed with detail and it is a proper lifesaver when you're trying to shoot touristy pics of massive buggers like this thing. And last up is the 13 megapixel telephoto lens with its 2 times optical zoom. You don't get any periscope tech here unfortunately, so this isn't as effective as some rivals like the S22 Ultra. This maxes out at a 20 times zoom, and to be honest there's no real point in going above 10 times zoom level, because at that point things are generally starting to look a bit fuzzy and occasionally not quite in focus. Still, at that 10 times level I found I got pretty much always a consistently good shot of a distant subject. You could also punch in towards a living subject like a fluffy kitty cat without intruding in their personal space. Now let's shift on to video which you can capture up to 4K resolution at either 30 or 60 frames per second. 
Even at that Ultra HD setting, you'll get smooth visuals when you're moving and shooting thanks to the excellent stabilisation, while the image quality in general is crisp and appealing. The Finex 5 Pro works well in HDR situations, capturing stronger detail in the lighter and the darker areas compared with some of the competition. You can zoom in and out easily enough, and the phone automatically swaps between the lenses to suit without too jarring an effect. Noise levels are minimal when you're shooting at night as well, courtesy of that good old Mazza processing unit, although this does tend to drain the battery life quite quickly. And no real complaints on the audio side, the phone captures everything going on all around without much wind distortion when things do get a bit gusty. And last up, that 32 megapixel selfie cam is another solid effort. Snap away in sunnier climbs and you'll still enjoy sharp, well-balanced pics, no worries. Those filters are back in action as well, although radiance ain't quite as effective with this lens, sadly. In more ambient light, you will get softer results and once again some blur as well if anyone actually dares to move, so you'll definitely want to pause and freeze. But the Oppo Find X5 Pro can automatically switch viewing angles to fit in extra heads when needed, which is a nice touch. Now one camera phone that is a bit trickier to track down here in the West, but is well worth the effort, is the Vivo X90 Pro. This sports some seriously premium specs, including the MediaTek Dimensity 9200 chipset with a massive vapor chamber so gaming fans can smash through Genshin all evening long. Plus you've got a big old battery with 120 watt wires and 50 watt wireless charging support. But it is the almighty one inch camera sensor that really impresses. You've got Vivo's usual camera app on the X90 Pro and it is an action packed affair, lots of toggles and modes. So for instance, you've got the Zeiss Natural Colour Mode, which is active by default. You can knock this off if you want more vivid, vibrant colours. That's definitely a good one to leave on if you want more natural looking hues. And the Vivo X90 Pro proves a worthy flagship camera phone to rival most of the big boys out there. My everyday test shots look sharp enough on bigger displays with accurate colours on show when that Zeiss mode was active. And that combination of the mighty 1-inch sensor and that V2 chip means that low light shots are impressively bright. Once again, with a strong amount of fine detail packed into every frame, especially when you're using that night mode. However, those tones don't often look as natural as I would have liked compared with some rivals like the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra and the Pixel 7 Pro. Strong contrast can also throw the Vivo quite shockingly in the evenings. And as ever, if your subject is moving when the shutter activates, you will get blurry NAF results. You've got plenty of other modes to check out here on the Vivo X90 Pro, including the obligatory portrait mode. This actually uses a separate 50 megapixel portrait sensor, the IMX758, with optical image stabilization again, plus 4 in 1 pixel binning for better looking night shots. And that portrait shooter did occasionally struggle to focus on my subject in lower light, although when it didn't bulk up, the results were usually pretty bloody decent. However, you can expect some rather extreme smoothing when using it with pets. You've got all kinds of different filters you can play around with here, including Cine Flare. So while that T-Star glass is supposed to prevent lens flaring and the rest, if you decide you actually want a bit of that, well, this'll do the job. There's a shag load of other bonus camera modes as well, including a high resolution effort which shoots 50 megapixel photos by default. And you've got a dedicated pro mode as well, so you can fiddle around with the likes of the ISO levels, the shutter speed, the white balance. And again, with the option of that Zeiss natural color, and you can also shoot in RAW. And where you want to shoot a bit of whole movie action where you can capture 4K Ultra HD footage at 30 or 60 frames per second or even bump it up to 8K resolution at 24 FPS. And I gotta say I liked a lot of the test footage that the Vivo spaffed out. Suddenly in those higher resolutions you've got a good amount of detail packed into every frame and even in low light situations things don't get too grainy or noisy and the focus seems to actually work alright now. Solid audio capture from all directions as well so overall for your whole movie action it's great stuff. And before we have a squint at the selfie cam, you've also got a third 12 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter here on the back end of the Vivo X90 Pro. It's the IMX663. And this is absolutely fine for getting a more pulled back view of the action, fit a bit more into frame. No telephoto shooter, sadly, unlike a fair amount of other premium flagship smartphones out there. But to be fair, that's a pretty decent camera setup. And you do have that high resolution mode, which you can always swap to if you do want to capture a 50 megapixel image and then crop in. And then last up for the camera tech here on the X90 Pro is a 32 megapixel selfie snapper. I'm not really a selfie fan at the best of times, but the Vivo did a respectable job. When I switched to portrait mode, I did find that I looked even more washed out than I actually do in real life. But apart from that, certainly did the job for your shareable shots. 
There's no 4K mode when you're shooting video with the front facing selfie cam though it does top off at 1080p Full HD at either 30 or 60 frames per second and when I've been doing a bit of Skyping and Zooming and stuff for this thing absolutely no issues with people picking up on my voice. No one's complained that I look even worse than I usually do. Now hands down one of the most impressive camera phones launched so far in 2023 is the Huawei P60 Pro. This gorgeous Wii Stunner unfortunately comes with the usual Huawei caveats including a lack of Google services and 5G action. However, that battery life is sublime, the OLED screen is gorgeous and there's more than enough power to run some slightly terrifying games with a satisfyingly smooth frame rate. But yes, the real highlight of the Huawei P60 Pro is definitely around back and I'm not talking about that Rococo action. Now the primary shooter slapped around at back is a 48 megapixel effort with optical image stabilization. And like a very small number of other smartphones, this actually boasts a variable aperture lens. You can skill it all the way from f4 all the way down to f1.4. And it's got 10 different steps from f1.4 to f4, which really puts the Xiaomi 13 Ultra to shame. Now f1.4 is incredibly wide for a smartphone snapper and it, this delivers some trouserially uplift and bulky on demand. You can really see what a difference this makes right there on the screen. Just bump the aperture down to f1.4 and you'll see everything gets beautifully smoothed out in the background. However, you will have to jump into the pro mode to actually adjust that aperture yourself. Otherwise on auto mode, it's all handled for you. And on full auto mode, the one with P60 Pro does spaff out some stunning looking shots. You've got all of the usual AI shenanigans which can boost colors and highlight textures for specific subjects which is especially noticeable when there's any kind of greenery involved in your snaps. Definitely knock off that Master AI mode if you prefer more realistic results, but I've got to say I rather liked the poppy outcome, which wasn't too severe at all. The P60 Pro serves up 12 megapixel photos by default, plenty of fine detail packed into every frame, and a supremely nippy shutter speed as well when the lighting isn't too cack, so perfect for shooting kids and other animals. And I've got to say, the HDR chops of the P60 Pro are absolutely outstanding. They're definitely among the very best I've seen on any mobile, riding that very fine line between overexposing the background and underexposing your subject, even in the most ridiculously stupidly tricky situations. This goat fella, or whatever he is, there's no way you should be able to see this much detail on the lad, right down to individual hairs. But like many flagship phones these days, the Huawei P60 Pro is all about that low light photography as well. And I certainly found that, again, in HDR style situations at night, the P60 Pro coped admirably. And while there is a certain amount of grain and noise introduced once the lighting gets really low, this thing is still impressive compared with many rivals. It can practically see in the dark. On the back end of the Huawei P60 Pro, you'll also find a 13 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter, which is fairly bog standard, but does the job if you want a more funky bit of framing or you just want to fit more into your photo. But the real treat is that 48 megapixel telephoto shooter, again with optical image stabilization, which is now better than ever in low light. We've got to say, results were impressive enough during the day. You can shoot an animal, a kid, whatever, from afar without interrupting them, disturbing them, so you can capture them going about their natural business. And things only start to look a little bit murky once you hit around the sort of 30 to 40 times zoom level. But even in low light, the P60 Pro could capture impressively crisp snaps from a distance with some pretty accurate color tones. And because the P60 Pro is so quick at capturing snaps, your subject doesn't even have to be completely still for the photo to look crispy and gorgeous. Oh, and there's also an obligatory telemacro mode so you can shoot up close snaps without getting right in your subject's face. And plenty of other camera modes stuffed onto the P60 Pro, including a portrait mode. There's also a dedicated night mode, which to be honest, I rarely touched because the general auto mode was so good in low light, but this does offer a longer exposure shot if you've got steady hands just to brighten things up a wee bit more. There is actually an aperture mode as well, which you can use if you don't want to dive into the full on pro mode, but I usually just stuck with pro. And plenty of other gubbins tucked away in there as well, the usual AR shenanigans, bit of high res action, although you don't need that to crop into your shots because you've got the telephoto. Now swap to video mode and you can shoot 1080p video, 720p, otherwise 4K as well at either 30 frames per second or 60 FPS, but there's no 8K option. And I've got to say again, for me certainly, the Huawei P60 Pro smashed it for the video. It's really got it locking onto your subjects and keeping them sharp, even if they're bouncing around like an absolute mentalist. The visuals are really, really sharp and smooth. The audio capture is really good as well. 
can pick up your voice clearly even with quite a bit of noise and chatter going on. Again, no issues with HDR style situations, pretty good in low light as well and the stabilisation is fantastic. And then last up, if you're into your selfies, your Instagrams, etc, you've got a 13 megapixel front facing shooter which again is pretty bloody good in a range of conditions. Even again with really stupidly tricky lighting, the P60 Pro can capture a good looking snap, keep you in focus and well saturated. And if you want to shoot a video, again you can capture up to 4K resolution footage at 30 or 60 frames per second using that front facing shooter. Now another of my favourite flagship smartphones of 2023 so far is the Xiaomi 13 Pro which comes packing top tier tech including a Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 2 for silky smooth performance as well as some serious media chops. And once again you get that almighty 1 inch Sony sensor that Vivo stuffed inside of its X90 Pro. The end result is incredibly bright and detailed photos in low light situations. The Xiaomi 13 Pro really can see in the dark, producing colourful pics with tonal details that the naked eye simply can't pick up. It's right up there with the Pixel 7 and the Galaxy S23 Ultra, coming somewhere just in between as far as colour accuracy is concerned. Just make sure that your subject is actually still in dim conditions because, as usual, you will end up with fuzzy results if they're not. When you venture out into daylight, you'll get beautifully sharp 12 megapixel snaps. Leica Vibrant is the recommended camera mode which, like Samsung smartphones, boosts those colours to make your photos look a little bit more lively. Otherwise, you can go with Leica Authentic if you want a more natural pick. It's entirely down to personal taste as to which you'll prefer, but I do like those poppy blue skies with the Vibrant mode on. And this time, your subject doesn't need to worry about pausing. That shutter speed and processing time is so fast that it's basically instant. Even awkward dynamic range doesn't throw this blower to the point where you can almost shoot directly into the sun. If you want to get a wee bit closer to your subject without distracting them or just because they're a fair distance away, the Xiaomi 13 Pro also serves up a 50 meg telephoto lens with 3.2 times optical zoom and again OIS. It's not quite the S23 Ultra but it's certainly useful, especially as tricky conditions like strong contrast rarely muff things up. And while you can actually zoom all the way into the 100 times level, things do get a wee bit abstract beyond about 30 times, at which point you might as well just use your imagination. That telephoto lens is also useful for portrait shots, and once again the Xiaomi 13 Pro excels here, even when your subject is bouncing around like a cooked up bunny. My test shots almost always came out clean with a lovely bulky effect in the background. And last up, there's a 50 meg ultra wide angle shooter serving up a 115 degree field of view. And it's pretty bloody good as far as ultra wides go, as long as you don't rely on it in dodgy lighting. And as always, you've got a healthy selection of bonus camera modes slapped here on the Xiaomi 13 Pro, including a Pro mode, how very apt, which can capture 10 bit raw images. Swap to video and this handset can film some supremely sharp 8K footage, or you can always activate Dolby Vision mode at 4K 60fps. Although even without HDR switched on, the Xiaomi 13 Pro coped well with harsh lighting and my test clips boasted natural looking colours. Even at 8K, the stabilisation here is seriously good. Hyper OIS for the win, baby. You can zoom in and out smoothly if you want to without a particularly jarring transition when swapping to the likes of the telephoto lens, while voices are clearly captured from all directions with minimal wind distortion. So overall, proper lush. And last up, that 32 megapixel selfie shooter can't quite see in the dark like the rear camera, but you do have a slightly startling screen flash mode to help out. Otherwise, in more ambient environments, the Xiaomi 13 Pro still pumps out a good snap without too much invader noise. Brighter backgrounds will be completely blown out, but your mug stays perfectly in focus, and I found that my skin tone, or lack thereof, was quite accurately captured. And hey, if you want to shoot a bit of vlog action using the Xiaomi 13 Pro, well you can do that at full HD resolution, sadly no 4K action for that front facer. But again, I found this phone was absolutely perfect for Skyping, Zooming, WhatsApping, whatever else. And if you've got even more cash to spunk on your shiny new camera phone, well, great news. You can upgrade to the Xiaomi 13 Ultra model for even more mega bucks. This boosts up the screen tech, you've got better battery charging, quite a lot of upgrades. Now you've got the same 50 megapixel primary shooter on the Ultra as the Pro, it's that massive 1 inch IMX989 sensor from Sony, with a bit of hyper optical image stabilisation to help prevent handshakes from ruining your shot. However there is one massive difference and that is the fact that the Ultra has a dual aperture setup. Drag down the camera settings and you will see the aperture 
option. Give this a little tappy tap and as you can see there you can swap between f1.9 and f4.0 otherwise you can just leave it on auto if you can't be bothered to think about it. And this is a great little feature you can obviously swap to f1.9 for those lower light shots and swap between the two to get a different depth of field. And as well as changing up the aperture you've got loads of other camera settings to piddle about with including the Leica style. I like to leave this on authentic for a more natural finish, but you can chuck it on like a vibrant if you really want to boost those visuals, have more poppy colors. And here's just a few of my sample shots that I snapped over the previous few days with the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. I found it works brilliantly at any time of day, whether you're shooting into bright light, dealing with harsh contrast, or snapping in more ambient surroundings. The focus is fast to act, shutter speed nice and nippy as well, so certainly shooting living subjects is as pain free as it could possibly be on a phone. And as I said, you can play around with the depth of field, get some lovely bokeh style action in your shots, and you've got that dedicated portrait mode to fall back on too. And those night shots certainly seem on a par with the likes of Samsung's Galaxy S23 Ultra. Those tones are boosted a bit, but plenty of detail packed in, despite the lack of light. By default, on the auto mode, the Xiaomi 13 Ultra captures 12 megapixel snaps using 4 in 1 pixel binning, but you do have a 50 megapixel high res mode if you want a bit of that. However, there's bugger all need to capture a high res shot and then crop in because the Xiaomi 13 Ultra has not just one telephoto lens, but two. So the Xiaomi 13 Pro had a 50 meg Samsung GN1 sensor. The Ultra upgrades this to a 50 meg Sony IMX858 sensor. It's a 75 mm telephoto shooter, f1.8 for improved low light performance and you've got optical image stabilization again. But zoom in further and the Ultra will swap to a 120 mm telephoto shooter, again using a 50 meg IMX898 sensor, this time with an f3.0 aperture and again a bit of OIS action. And as you can see here, the zoom shots on the Xiaomi 13 Ultra are absolutely stunning stuff. You get incredible amounts of detail from a ridiculous distance. And this thing tops off at 120 times zoom, beating even the mighty 100 times spear zoom of the Samsung. Although, understandably, things get a bit blotchy and blurry and surreal once you get to those sorts of levels. And then, yes, just like that Pro model, you also have a 50 megapixel ultra wide angle shooter. Certainly does the job if you want to fit an awful lot of stuff into frame, you just want a more dramatic shot. Doesn't tinker with those tones too much, you still get a nice natural vibe. And then if you want to shoot some home movies, you can capture footage all the way up to 8K resolution, but you are stuck at 24 frames per second. Otherwise, if you bump it down to the likes of 4K, you can then chuck it up to 60 FPS. And yes, you can once again mess around with that aperture as long as you're shooting with the primary lens. And here's some sample footage that I shot again these last few days. Really, really happy with the results. I think it's right up there again with the Samsungs and the Apples out there. If you've actually got an 8K display to enjoy that 8K footage, then yes, absolutely stunning stuff. Otherwise, I found my 4K footage had plenty of fine detail packed into every frame. The colors again came out really nice and natural. Stabilization was fantastic as well. Even on those higher levels, you can move and shoot as merrily as you like. And the audio was only really muffled when I was, for instance, crossing a very blustery London bridge. And this Xiaomi blower also does really well for a bit of night footage right up there with its Oppo rivals. Those visuals don't get too soft and grainy unless it's proper full-on dark. And then up front, if you are a selfie fan, well, you've got a very capable 32 megapixel front-facing shooter. I'm not exactly the world's biggest fan of taking selfies, but even I can appreciate that the Ultra does a pretty fine job, even in tricky lighting if you're shooting against a bright background or in quite ambient surroundings. You'll still tend to get plenty of decent detail, a nice well-balanced shot. However, unlike some rivals, you can't shoot video at 4K resolution using the Xiaomi 13 Ultra's front-facing camera. It does top off at 1080p full HD, but again, you know, pretty good. It's detailed enough so your video doesn't look naff when you view it back on a laptop or whatever. Audio pickup really good as well, so again, this phone is fine for Skype and zooming. Now, if you know your way around a DSLR, chances are you'll get on really bloody well with the Sony Xperia 1 Mark V. This feature-packed flagship boasts Sony's standard slick design. You got some fantastic tools for creators, a powerful gaming experience, and of course, the usual professional camera tools that are a cut above the competition. Sony has partially overhauled the camera tech versus last year's model with a fresh new 24mm Exmor T sensor chucked in. It's a 52 meg sensor, but it does capture 12 megapixel images using a bit of pixel binning, and you don't have any choice in the matter, there's no ultra high res mode or anything like that. Now when you first boot up Sony's Photo Pro app, this is what you're presented with and it can certainly look a bit daunting if you're more used to a Samsung phone or an iPhone for instance. 
But here in the basic mode, you've basically got a point and shoot style setup with a few extra features chucked in if you want them. Right here, you can swap between all of the different sensors. You can tweak the brightness of the contrast levels. You've also got a bokeh option. You can turn on the boost mode with a quick tap of this icon here. You've also got a variety of filters to choose from, a small variety, six in total. You could also toggle the night mode, turn on the flash and change up the aspect ratio. In Photo Pro, you can now also quickly and easily shoot some video. And Sony has also chucked in a new product showcase mode for video twats such as myself. They like to show off phones and various other items in their videos so it won't just focus on their face full time. If you want to do more than simply point and shoot, where you've got a variety of DSLR style modes, you can swap into the auto mode. This basically operates similar to the basic mode except with more of a DSLR style setup. However, the Xperia will still handle all of the tweaking of the controls and everything on your behalf, so it is still a case of point and shoot using that shutter button if you are holding it landscape mode. If you want a bit more control of your shot, well, just stick it into program auto mode and you can then piddle about with the EV levels and also the ISO levels, mess around with the white balance, etc. You've also got your shutter speed priority mode if you want to capture an action snap or get a really funky low light shot. And last up, a good bit of manual exposure. Now, the Xperia 1 Mark V's autofocus is enhanced with upgraded Clever Clogs AI algorithms to help keep your subject sharp even if they're bloody miles away while AI is also used to calculate the white balance and adjust the exposure. And the great news is, for the most part, it works pretty chuffing well. If you just want to point and shoot and ignore the deep manual controls, well, the Mark V is good enough to pump out balanced, detailed stills that can be instantly shared. Don't expect this phone to make like the Galaxy S23, however, and spruce up your pics with warmer tones to make food look more appetizing and flowers more flowery or anything like that. What you will get though is natural colour reproduction so vivid subjects will often shine. Crazy contrast usually isn't a problem either. The Xperia 1 Mark V can't quite capture stunning bright blue skies as well as our pixels say as the dynamic range isn't quite as strong, but very few of my snaps look like the colours had been bleached. Between the excellent face and eye autofocus and that burst shutter feature, capturing an action shot of your kids or your pets cocking about is pleasingly simple. The autofocus is, as always, a ruddy marvel, ignoring foliage and other matter which would trip up lesser devices. Plus, as in a gorgeous bokeh style blur, it's as easy as two quick taps as I previously showed, complete with a slider to max out or calm down the effect. Now, the Xperia 1 Mark V's fresh new Exmo T sensor is apparently 1.7 times larger than last year's flagship phone, so it should be significantly better for the low light shooting. And certainly in ambient lighting, you'll get pin shop photos and the picture quality doesn't get grainy until true darkness descends. But in auto mode, Sony's blower isn't quite as impressive as the Galaxy S23 Ultra or the Xiaomi 13 Ultra for night photography. But then that is where those pro controls come in, allowing you to mess around with the EV levels and also the shutter speed if you want some psychedelic results. And the Xperia 1 Mark V also sports a pair of 12 megapixel sensors. First up is a 16mm Exmor RS ultra wide angle snapper, which is fine, but not as consistent as that primary sensor for colour capture. You'll get some pretty awesome scenery shots, it's definitely a useful one for those poncing about being a tourist moments, but it's nothing special. And last up is a variable 85 to 125mm Exmor RS telephoto shooter, and this allows you to zoom in up to 15.6 times in total. It's certainly no space zoom, and even at that limited maximum range, you'll still get quite fuzzy results. While the telephoto shooter also struggles a bit in quite bright light, as well as softer light when you're indoors or in the evening time. So overall, the extra options outside of that spangly new Exmo T sensor are a bit of a letdown compared with, for instance, the Pixel 7 Pro, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra, etc. The Cinema Pro app acts exactly as before. You've got full control over the focus, which sensor you're using, and all the various other settings as well. Video maxes out at 4K resolution as usual, there's no 8K option here, but you could once again shoot Ultra HD footage at up to 120 frames per second with all three lenses for impressive flexibility. Bearing in mind that colours and detail levels can take a bit of a hit when you're swapping outside of that main sensor. Focus is usually excellent unless there are many faces in shot, in which case the Xperia can get a bit confused unless you specifically tap to target one subject, understandable enough. And you can even get some decent nighttime results, although any strong lighting does tend to be blown out. 
and also make sure you choose stereo audio pickup from the video settings if you want to include a bit of commentary in your videos otherwise your voice will sound quite faint. And last up is that 12 megapixel selfie shooter and it's a pretty solid effort again, certainly for those quick and dirty shareable shots. Even bright backgrounds don't bollocks up your snap and even when you're lingering in murkier climbs the Xperia 1 Mark V can still suck up a respectable amount of detail and reasonably close skin tones. Another rather impressive flagship phone launched in 2023 is the Honor Magic 5 Pro, a 6.8 inch mega bastard packed with premium tech including that old favourite the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 for meaty everyday performance plus a 5100mAh capacity battery for all day play. But of course one of the biggest features of the Magic 5 Pro both metaphorically and literally is that flipping massive camera which dominates the arse end. All of Honor's marketing shenanigans are pretty much entirely focused on that eye of muse camera tech to the point where they've even partnered up with the Guinness Book of World Records where they showed off an impressively sharp photo of a sporty man doing jumpy stuff. But anyway, what you have here is a 50 meg primary sensor, the Sony IMX878, which is a mind bigger than Samsung's S23 Ultra sensor, although not quite as big as the Xiaomi 13 Pros. I've had no issues at all using the camera, that shutter speed is crazy quick and the phone does a blinding job with live and breathing subjects who refuse to keep still for more than 3 milliseconds. I was particularly impressed with the portrait mode which captures faces and objects cleanly, keeping them nice and crispy while smudging out the background with some sexy bokeh style blurring. Textures and tones give a natural vibe to your pics and this is true no matter what you're shooting, be it food, felines, huge f**k off buildings, whatever you fancy. And the Honor Magic 5 Pro can handle strong contrast, dodgy lighting and other testing conditions just as well as other popular flagship blowers. In more ambient environments, those detail levels stay strong and colours are still accurately captured. And then for low light snaps, that sizeable sensor is supported with some tasty optical image stabilisation, so you'll get bright crisp snaps to rival the S23 Ultra. And as well as the 878, the Magic 5 Pro also serves up two additional lenses, a 50 meg ultra wide angle shooter and a 50 meg telephoto option. That ultra wide is one of the better efforts that I've tested lately as not only do you get sharp finely detailed picks but those tones don't take much of a hit while strong and crappy lighting is again handled well. And if you'd rather get closer to the action instead the telephoto snapper serves up a 3.5 times optical zoom that rivals Samsung's S23 Ultra and the Pixel 7 Pro. This once again maxes out at 100 times total zoom just like Sammy's space zoom shenanigans Although yeah, once you zoom in too much things do get a wee bit abstract. It is still mightily impressive however with image stabilisation to help prevent blurry snaps. And as always you've got plenty of other camera modes to piddle about with as well, the likes of a pro mode, your obligatory macro stuff. As for video that can be captured at up to 4K resolution, there's no 8K option here unlike many other flagships these days. But Ultra HD does a great job for your home movies, most of the time at least. Those visuals can be a little bit poppy, occasionally dipping a toe into oversaturated in quite bright conditions and in softer light I did find that the primary lens occasionally struggled to figure out what it was supposed to be focusing on. It's not quite a Samsung or an Apple beta then but it's still respectable with strong audio capture. Oh and if you fancy yourself as a bit of a Spielberg there is a movie mode with various filters to play around with just to change up the mood a bit. And finally up front the Magic 5 Pro serves up a 12 megapixel selfie shooter with accompanying depth sensor and as long as you stay reasonably still you will get a good looking shot 9 times out of 10. It's not too put out by strong backlighting while the portrait mode once again does a cracking job. So there you have it my lovelies, my pick of the very best camera phones you can bag yourself right now in 2023 and don't worry if you find that your budget can't stretch up to many of these phones because they are mostly upper mid range and flagship devices. I have also done you a roundup of the best budget camera phones right now, you can see it right here on Techspert. In the meantime, if I've missed out your own pick of the best camera phone right now in 2023, well, feel free to call me a massive in the comments below and let us know what your personal pick is. I've only included stuff that I've personally tested and reviewed. Please do plug subscribe, ding that notifications bell, all the usual YouTube bollocks and have yourselves a wonderful rest of the week. Cheers!